I was uh, in the United States Air Force from 19, um, January 18, 1964 until October 18, 1968. I got out of the Air Force four months early to go back to, the, uh, to, go back to school, basically. Um, when I left, I, my rank was sergeant. I had a top secret crypto security clearance. I had worked with Tactical Air Command uh, in Langley Air Force Base in Virginia, the 44-44th Reconnaissance Technical Group. The group was involved in photographic reconnaissance. Um, they, uh, they were working with the, the U-2 planes, the, the spy satellite photography, before anyone knew we had it at that point in time. No one knew that we were doing spy photography, spy satellite photography. Uh, of course, no one knew we had the U the U two uh, program uh, operating, uh, or what the capabilities of that program were. We also did uh, gun camera and uh, uh, reconnaissance film from C one thirties, all sorts of, of aircraft that were going into uh, combat situations. We processed the f the film for that. It was. Uh, 1965, uh, I believe it was about June or July of 1965, sometime in that time frame. Um, my boss came to me, I was working in a color lab at that time, I was a technician, photographic technician with a uh, you know, background in electronics, I'd been trained in electronic photographic repair. At, uh, in Colorado at uh, Lowry Air Force Base. Actually the school was a year long. The organization that I was in was a brand new uh, installation. It was uh, put in place to um, facilitate uh, the, um, the escalation of the Vietnam War. So we were in a new facility. I had come there in January of 1965 to start that facility up. Um, we installed all the equipment uh, there, there were everything from printing presses, uh, we were doing map making as well. We were also, one of the things we were involved in was uh, uh, doing uh, automatic terrain sensing. We, would, uh, we had f simulators that did terrain. We, you, you put a huge map in the, facility, in the, in the uh, simulator, a terrain map, and you flew a camera over that and did a recording of the terrain and then they installed that film in a plane and the plane could then fly in under radar was called ATRAN and no one knew we had that capability at the time as well. So we, we were installing all of that equipment. At any rate, I was in a color lab one day when my, my boss, uh, Sergeant Staff Sergeant Taylor, came over to me and said that they were having a problem with some equipment uh, on the base uh, and it was the first lunar orbiter program where they had a mission to pretty much locate the first landing sites for the, uh, for the 1969 uh, lunar mission for the astronauts. So at any rate, he said they were having some problem with equipment over there. It was a similar equipment that we had. It was computerized contact printing equipment. And he wanted to know if I would go over and take a look at it. And he said to me, it's, a, it's an NSA facility. And at the time, I didn't know what NSA was. I was pretty naive. And I thought he said NASA. So in my mind, all, all, for a long time, I thought it was a NASA facility that I'd gone to, but I remembered him saying NSA and converting it in my own mind to, to NASA. And for viewers, the NSA is? It's the National Security Agency. And I didn't know much about the National Security Agency until probably 10 or 15 years ago. Now the interesting thing, when, it, when, this, when, when, this, when my boss came to me, at that point in time, I only had a top secret security clearance. I didn't get my crypto security clearance for a few more weeks. It takes, it takes years to get a high level security clearance like that and they start that when you're in school. And only the, um, the honor graduates from these schools are the people who get the high level security clearances. They also get to choose their, uh, their duty assignment, which is really quite nice. It just was a fluke. I just happened to be well prepared for what I was doing when I went to school. And how did you get to be in a position where you actually were to deal with the material we are about to discuss? I, I was asked to go over to this facility on Langley Air Force Base where the NSA was uh, bringing in the information from the lunar orbiter. And so I packed up some tools, I went over, uh, I went into the facility, 
As I approached the facility, it was uh, very lightly guarded. I mean, the base was under high security at any rate. I was surprised that the, there wasn't uh, a higher level of security outside of the facility as I look back on it later. I went into the facility. I gave them my low-level security badge. They gave me a higher-level security badge. Um, a couple of officers took me into this hangar. It was a very large hangar. As I walked in, there were, there were people from other countries, a lot of foreign people from other countries in civilian clothes with interpreters with them, with security badges hanging around their neck. And the first thing I thought to myself, if this is NASA, what are all these foreigners doing here? What are all these people from other countries speaking other language? Didn't make any sense to me. And I was really quite impressed with that. It just didn't grok. You know, I was, you know, what are, what are all of these people doing here? And they were very quiet, very reserved, and there was a very peculiar pal hanging over them. Um, they were very, they had a very concerned demeanor, okay? So they took me into this laboratory. I took a look at the equipment. There was an airman second class in there. I was an airman second class as well. He turned the equipment on and put it through its paces. It didn't do what it was supposed to do. I saw what was going on with it. I said, I, I need to do some troubleshooting on it. It had little printed circuit boards in it with discrete components at that time. It was before we had integrated circuits. And I said to him, you know, we'll have to take this thing out of the lab if we're going to work on it. We can't work in it, on it in here in the darkroom environment. So he called someone to get some people to come in and move it. It was about the size of a small apartment refrigerator. It, you know, it wasn't something you could easily move. So everyone left the facility, left the darkroom, except this airman second class and myself. And we're in waiting for someone to come to remove this piece of equipment. So while I'm in there, I said to him, and I'm really fascinated with this process. How do they get the images from the lunar orbiter to the laboratory here? And he went through the whole process describing how the various radio telescopes around the world were linked and they telemetered the data into Langley Field. And at the time, I didn't know what the real purpose of this dark room and this operation and this facility was. I thought this was where they were bringing the data in and then releasing the images to the public. I had no idea that there were other issues involved in, in this facility. So he, he starts telling me all of this information and I knew that what we were doing was, was, was classified anyway and that he could only share a certain level of what he was doing with me because of the part, compartmentalized nature of, of our jobs. At any rate, I um, you know, he told me how everything worked. He showed me the equipment where the digital information came in, where it was converted to photographic images. They were doing 35 millimeter strips of film at that time, which were then assembled into 18 and a half by 11 inch uh, mosaics, they were called. There was a digital signature and a grayscale on every 35 millimeter strip. And those, those strips were from successive passes around the moon, and they would take and build up a photograph. They would scan one section of the moon, then another and another, and then they would get a larger image. So this mosaic then would be put in that contact printer and that was then a print that was issued to whomever, the press, the scientist, whatever, wherever that was intended to go. So he was showing me how all this worked and we walked over to one side of the lab and he said, by the way, we've discovered a base on the back side of the moon. And I said, I said, whose? <laughs> what do you mean, whose? He said, yes, there's, we've discovered a base on the back side of the moon. And at that point, I become, became frightened and I was a little terrified, thinking to myself that if anybody walks in the room now, I know we're, we're in jeopardy, we're in trouble, because he shouldn't be giving me this information. I was fascinated by it, but I also knew that he was overstepping a boundary that he shouldn't be stepping over. And then he pulled out one of these mosaics and showed, showed this base, which had geometric shapes. There were towers. There were uh, spherical uh, buildings. Uh, there were very tall uh, towers and things that looked somewhat like radar dishes, but they were large structures. So I, um, I didn't say any more to him because I was concerned again that somebody was going to come in at any moment would catch us having this conversation and we would be in, in, in real trouble. 
I realized that he was telling me this information because he didn't have anybody else to talk to. Now probably in that laboratory he was probably one of the few uh, enlisted people and he was a worker bee. And he had a high level security clearance obviously. But he couldn't share that information with anybody else. And in those days we didn't. When you had your security clearance you took it seriously. It isn't like today where people don't take these things seriously. We had a different set of morals and ethics and values. That's the way we were raised and we, we stayed bound by those agreements. So it was rare that someone would, would do something like this, but this fellow and I were the same rank. I think he, he was very distressed. Uh, he, he had the same pallor and demeanor as the scientists outside the room. They were just as concerned as he was. And he needed to, he needed to discuss it with somebody. So that was the end of it right there. I didn't take it any further than that. I, you know, I, I just filed it away. But the interesting thing, every day that I went home, I would think to myself, I can't wait to hear about this on the news, you know. And, you know, so I'd turn on the TV and I'd look at the news to see if they're going to announce, we've discovered a base on the back side of the moon, being really naive, you know. And, of course, here it is 30-some years later and we still haven't heard about it. But uh, I, it, at the time I had uh, been given about 30 of these uh, photographs. Not, they weren't photographs with artifacts in them, but they were photographs from that contact printer. I had some of them autographed by Dr. Colley, who was the head of the project at that time. And when I left San Francisco a few years ago, I actually sold them all in a yard sale because I was tired of carrying them around. And I may have a couple of them filed away someplace, but it was probably one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made. What was really interesting is I'm not sure what the resolution on those photographs were, but I know that we could discern from the satellite photography we were doing at our installation, you could read the license number off a car at that point in time. So I know we had that level of technology available. Whether or not it was on that lunar orbiter, I don't know. And this also always brings to question, in my mind, why we're getting so, such low resolution on photographs that we receive from Mars and any of these other missions, the resolution of these photographs is very low when we've had since the early 60s a capability of much higher resolution. So I'm not sure what that's all about. That, always, that question always comes up in my mind. If I compare it to what I'm seeing now, because I do have photographs that have artifacts in them that are similar to what I saw, they're massive. Some of the structures are, you know, half a mile in, in, in size. So they're, they're huge structures. Yeah, I mean, and they're all different size structures in different photographs. You would have to have an above top secret security clearance, which generally would be crypto, uh, cryptologic or above. In, in my case, you know, I ultimately did have a cryptologic security clearance, and when I did have that clearance, I had access to all of the imagery uh, from the U2s, from the satellite photography. I had access to everything we were doing. Now, the, the thing that was interesting about my job as an electronics technician, I got to go into every area of the facility. I got to go into the war room at, at SAC, Strategic Air Command, and, and did maintenance on equipment there. So I would see a lot of data that people generally wouldn't see with my rank. Normally you would go into your job, you'd do your one little task. If you're a photographic interpreter, that's all you did. You didn't discuss what you did with anyone else. If you worked on U2 imagery, you worked on U2 imagery. If you worked on satellite imagery, you worked on satellite imagery. But you didn't discuss your job with anyone else. And you only did your, your task. If you were a photographic processor, you only processed the images. You were not allowed to discuss what you saw in those images with anyone else. We were briefed extensively about what this compartmentalization, compartmentalization looked like. You know, you didn't have conversations about what you were doing. So for me, I got to go into all these different areas and see what each of these people were doing, and some of them did share what they were doing. They would have photographs of, of the missile emplacements above their, above their desk that they'd discovered, or they'd have photographs of the missiles on the decks of the, of the, air, the Russian aircraft carriers, or I'd see various uh, fresh spoil from a satellite photography around a missile emplacement in the Sinai Peninsula, as an example. 
We had in, in one room in our organization, we had a map of the Sinai Peninsula at that time that was made up from satellite photography. It was a mosaic. And it was 60 feet high and 60 feet wide. It was massive with great detail. So, I mean, it just, it was fascinating. And I saw vehicles, and I, I saw vehicles on these satellite photography that, that you could read the license plate on. They actually showed me that, so I know that that was something that, that was real. At any rate, getting back to the compartmentalization, I had access to lots of different areas only because I was a technician moving from area to area. The only other person that would have had that kind of access would have been an officer with a high level security clearance that had a need to know. Bottom line, if you didn't have a need to know, there wasn't any reason to discuss what you knew with anyone else. And even if someone asked, if they didn't have a need to know and they didn't have a security clearance, you couldn't discuss it with them. Right. Everyone, everyone wears a security badge with a specific color and you know that that color represents a specific level of security clearance. And as you move from area to area within an organization, you get into higher and higher levels of secure area. Uh, you'll go through a gate, you go into a vault, you exchange your, your badge for another badge of a higher level of security. You're briefed on your job as to what your level of conversation can be with another person. You know, I was told, don't ask, don't discuss, just go in and fix the equipment. We'd sit down with a security officer and he would review what your activities were, what you were doing, what you were allowed to do. They didn't ask you what you'd seen, they know, knew what I was seeing because they knew, knew what I had access to. I was told to be very cautious uh, when I was off base. I was told not to drink. I was told not to get intoxicated. I was told not to do drugs. I was told to be very cautious of people striking up a friendship with me because there were um, people who were gathering this sort of information. There, were, there, were, there was a lot of espionage around the base, military espionage, or, or foreign es espionage. You can cut that one out. At any rate, I was, you know, I was told, don't let anyone take my photograph. Be very cautious about where I traveled, when I traveled. I knew that I couldn't go any place for at least five years without telling the State Department where I, where I was after I left the military. Uh, anytime I traveled, I had to notify and get permission to travel any place I traveled at that point in time in the United States. They had to know where I was all the time. We were told that when we traveled over a, a foreign area, as an example, if we went to Vietnam, there was always someone there with us, with a gun, ready to annihilate us, basically, if we were, should fall into the hands of the enemy. They didn't want the enemy to get us. We would be killed instead. So we, we knew we were operating under these sort of conditions, that um, your life was in jeopardy all the time should you fall into the wrong hands. So we, we were aware of that. Um, I was told when I left that I would be investigated on a regular basis to make sure that I wasn't involved in any peculiar activities that didn't suit the government's needs. My yeah. security clearance expired in, uh, I, I believe it was either October or January of 1998. And, and it was about 1998 that uh, I, I actually after my security clearance expired, I discussed what I had seen with my sister because she was interested in the phenomena. I read Colonel Corso's book, The Day After Roswell. In the book he said a lot of fantastic things. And he also said, near the end of the book, that there was a base on the backside of the moon. And when he said that, I said, aha. So I, I began to believe that everything he was saying was true. And he was saying a lot of really profound things about the crash in Roswell and alien technology and. Uh, whatever and how it had been mainstreamed through the Office of Foreign Technology by himself. So I knew that he was probably telling the truth. It just says, said to me, this, this guy's telling the truth because I've had this experience and I know it's real. Yeah, it was Edgar Mitchell. He said, come forward and I said, okay, it's time to, to start stepping out with this information. Because I was a little irritated, you know, that the government had been lying about all of this for years and covering it up. And uh, um, I felt it was time to get beyond that. It, it's, there's a lot more weight to this than, than I realized, you know, a lot more uh, cover-up than I realized. <laughs> yeah, a lot more deception than I realized was going on. Well, some of the shapes, as I said, were, some of the buildings were, were very tall, 
thin structures. I don't know how tall they were, but they must be very tall. Uh, Did you see profile shots of them? I or saw angular shots with they shadows. They were angular shots with shadows. Uh, there, there were there were spherical and domed buildings, spherical and domed buildings uh, that were very large. Um, they they must be you know half a mile in in in, in scale because they were. In relationship to the scale of the photograph, they 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 stood out very clearly. They were large objects. Um, it's interesting because I tried to relate them in my own mind to to structures here on Earth, and they they don't compare to anything that you see here in, in scale and structure. They're similar to to a degree. Um, I mean, I tried to relate them to metal structures, and I couldn't see a metal definition. They're more like a uh, uh, a stone structure, but a fabricated stone. But some of the buildings uh, seem to have uh, very reflective surfaces on them. Uh, so a couple of structures that I saw reminded me of um, cooling towers at, at uh, power generating plants. They had that sort of a shape. Uh, some of them that were, were just very, very straight and tall with a flat top. Uh, some of them were round. Some of them looked like a Quonset hut, you know, with a domed kind of, like a greenhouse. And all of these buildings were clustered together. Centrally. There were there were, the particular shot that I saw. There were several clustered together over a landscape, a fairly large landscape. Mm -hmm. There there was um, one building that had a a dish-like shape to it, but it was very large. Uh, it looked like a radar dish, but it was a building. It could have been a radar dish. Uh, you know, it, it, there was another building near it with a truncated top, that, with an angular top that was truncated. I didn't want to look at it any longer than that because I felt that my life was in jeopardy. Did you understand what I'm saying? I would love to have looked at it longer. I would have loved to have had copies. I would love to have you know, said more about it or discussed it more. But I knew I couldn't, and I knew that the young fellow who was sharing this was really, really overstepping his bounds at that point. I felt that he, he just needed somebody to talk to. He couldn't, he hadn't discussed it, couldn't discuss it, and he wasn't, he wasn't doing it for any ul ulterior motive other than the fact that I think he was, he had the weight of this thing on him, and it was distressing to him. Whitish disc. Totally silent, apparently, flying extremely fast, and it had a, a bluish light on top, on the apex. Uh, it was that bluish color that you get in uh, arc welding, and that was coming on rhythmically, so that as it went across the sky, you could say it's coming on there, got to come on there, got to come on there, got to come on there.